what kind of advice can you give people that are looking to get a job to do 3D character art? Weirdly, there's a big disconnect between uh, the quality of the portfolio and the, the, them as production artists. You need somebody who's gonna persevere. Like you need somebody who's not gonna drop the ball when it gets hard, because it's gonna get hard. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're gonna have a lot of revisions to do and you have to accept them and do them to your best. And yeah. even thing, when things are hard, if there's something to, to, to get from our three hours talk is don't take things personally. I know yes. it's hard. Yes. I, I'm not listening to my own advice right now, but <laughs> I mean, but I fully agree with you though. Yeah. I mean, you just can't feel destroyed by it, and you just have to keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Going and going. This is me starting in video game studios when I didn't know these things. Like, uh, my lead or my boss back then would like give me feedback, which sometimes was very much on point but I wasn't always in the mental space that I was ready to accept that feedback and I would just get like really frustrated, you know? Um, because I'm like, no, but they don't understand what is the creative vision that I'm going for here or something like that. You know, like we sort of make up all these kind of stories, you know? I had to learn and life became so much better for me when I always kind of had that idea of, yeah, like I want to fully dedicate myself to my art, but at the same time, I always want to detach myself emotionally from my art or from what I do in a production environment enough in that- production. Yeah, that if someone criticizes the work that I do, like it, it hasn't just completely ruined my, my whole day there, you know? Guillaume, welcome to the stream. Yes, welcome, glad to be here. Thanks for the invitation. <laughs> cool, 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 yeah. It's well, been too long. We yeah, should like, chat more often, yeah. Sure. Well, uh, you and I, we go back for like a few years. Like uh, we've known each other. I'm trying to remember like what's the year exactly that we met. Like we met at IDOS Montreal. That's kind of where we started to uh, yes. work uh, together for the first time there while you were working on, uh, uh, I don't want to, uh, I'll, I will leave the punchlines for you essentially. But yeah, like <laughs> you and I, we go back like at least 10 years, I think. Uh, we do. So Laura was my lead at IDOS Montreal. So we go way back for sure. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so essentially the uh, the format is, you know, like uh, Guillaume and uh, myself will have a conversational approach to this interview. The last thing I want is to have to ask questions and then we get dry answers and then we move on to a different one, really. So uh, truth be told, you guys may not even see questions asked, really. We'll try to organically weave a discussion that covers all the topics uh, that mm -hmm. we have planned beforehand. Um, but just to start us off, essentially, Guillaume, um, could you run us through a little bit of your history? I'll show the things and then you do the talking. How's that? Yeah. Talking. Cool. So my name is Guillaume. I'm born and raised in Montreal. Uh, I've been uh, in the industry since 2005, where I started at Ubisoft as a general modeler. So for all of you up there, uh, it's very, it's not usual to start as a character artist. So you have to get your foot through the door. Uh, for me, it was as a general modeler, so I did mostly uh, props and environment at the beginning. And then I had the chance of moving uh, to IDOS Montreal as a character artist, where I met Laura, where I met Marco, where I met Cedric. I met a lot of uh, important people over there. And I worked on Thief. I don't know if that's what you were, but yeah, yeah, what yeah, the yeah. big secret was. I mean, well, it's not a secret, but <laughs> I don't want to steal the punchlines from you. I mean, Thief has a lot of potential, and it was really, really cool, and I'm, I'm really happy with my choice. Um, and then I moved uh, to California at an offer to go work uh, on the next MOBA uh, and be very, very rich, and it didn't work out. But <laughs> I met my wife over there, so everything's good. And uh, That was the time you were at Artillery Games, right? That's that right. So that's what you see right now. So. It was a very small thing, a uh, small team. We worked on in Palo Alto. It was an amazing experience. I don't know, Laura, we can talk about it, but I think it's very important to at least 
once in your life to completely like go in another country and like be vulnerable and learn as a human being and oh i lost you up there um no uh, i'm still here <laughs> and um yeah i think you could say the same like i think everybody should at least leave their uh, home when once in their life so i really loved the yeah. experience and then i came back and worked uh at Ubisoft, my old love uh, on Far Cry 5. And then uh, Chaos Mason uh, offered me a position, but I couldn't say no. And then since then, I've been working uh, with my buddies at Chaos Mason on uh, multiple projects. So recently, I've worked on that little indie game called Fortnite. I don't know if you, you've heard of it. Um, I've heard it. I've heard a term before, but I, I really wouldn't know what that is. Like, it's like kids like to say that word for some reason. I'm like, I don't know what that's a reference to. Oh. It's funny. Like, a couple is of that years like a ago, different type of uh, Pokemon, or uh... <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> when you could go outside and be with people, I remember seeing like a bunch of kids together, and like eighty percent of the time they were talking about Fortnite. So it's it's been an, an amazing experience. So. And before that, I worked uh, on Borderlands, uh, worked on Shardbound. And uh, yeah, it's been a crazy experience. It's still going on. Yeah, you've worked on so many different projects that all have different art styles and different uh, just artistic expression. I find that very yeah. fascinating. Yeah. I absolutely agree with you. And, and I, I echo 100% your feeling that, uh, well, you know, I don't like to use the term should, but I definitely think that there is something great and extremely satisfying about going to work in a different uh, country for uh, some time, you know? Like, truth be told, when I moved to the, the, to the Netherlands, I wasn't sure myself how long I was going to stay there, but I was prepared that, you know, if things were going to work out, to pretty much stay there for my whole life, you know? Um, it, it's, it changed so much how I think of the world, you know? Like, it, personally, it really just opened up myself to the whole world, you know? It's like, when you grow up here in uh, Quebec, um, there's like a few things about Quebec that are um, perhaps idiosyncrasies Careful. about the place here. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, you what you going to say. It's like, oh, my God. Uh, but, you know, like there's a few things that like if you grow up here that, um, you know, like the local challenges, if I could put it that way, uh, whether they are uh, political or something else, they really kind of take like they're kind of the whole world for you. In a way, you know, because like it's the world that you have always known. It's where you have always grown. Um, and the moment that you kind of go and work in a different country for me, like it, it really, it changed my perception of the world, of people, of different cultures, in a great positive way. And I don't think that could have happened any other way, really. It's funny because it made me appreciate Montreal too, and Canadians and Quebecers, how nice they are, and I can just reflect through my wife who's from california and maybe it's my karma too but i'm extremely lucky so every time i lose my key or something and I, it always gets back to me and she's blown away she's always like canadian she's just so nice so the the cliche moves on i tell you that we're really really lucky to be here and um and uh, be with our people and i think you have to leave to be appreciated fully yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, getting back to your portfolio here, like, <laughs> it seems like your time at Chaos Masons um, has really been, like, creatively, I, I mean, I may be putting words in your mouth here, but it sounds like a very creatively satisfying period of your life. Yeah. I don't know whether that is true or not, or what you think of that, but, like, a lot of work here is time that you have worked at uh, Chaos, and yeah. you have things from so many different games and art styles in here from Charbound, uh, Border Night, Fortnite, uh, these sorts of things, you know, that it's like, wow, like, how is it to always be working like that on different games, different art styles? Um, is it creatively satisfying? Yeah, it is. But I think it's just, I think me coming into my own in the last couple of years like you can you can see my monkey robot so the the last one to the the second art style i did i think 
the whole time I always had like that style. I, that's what I, I actually appreciated, but I, I was never asked to do it professionally. Uh, I always, because in Montreal, we did mostly realistic with Assassin's Creed and even their sex or rainbow sex. And recently, I think there's been a move uh, in the industry. I think, first of all, with um, um, Overwatch and then um, Fortnite that like, gave the idea to all uh, all those game companies to make stylized work. So I feel like my own interest and the interest of, uh, of the industry merged together recently. And I think that's been super interesting and beneficial to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess we could say that working at Chaos is really a career highlight then, right? Yes. Yeah, that. that's, that's, that's what your second question, I think, that, yeah, my biggest high career a highlight is that you see through my uh, whole portfolio and you see even the, the monkey was 2008. That's, that's like ages ago. I'm sure some of the people in the chat like were like in diapers at that time. <laughs> 2008, right? I was like, wait, so we're in 2021 now, so that was uh, 14 years ago, right? So That's right. Yeah, God, you and I were so young back then. God, uh, <laughs> um, I mean, I, I wasn't in diapers, but I was, uh, I think I was barely graduating from like school see. back then. So I'm old. Um, so I think, yeah, my, my highlights is probably to have worked so hard and persevered and that it was recognized by... Marco and Cedric at Chaos Mason, and that now we're building something together that is our own thing. And I think I would like to think that the best is still to come, and it's just has started. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, well, I think so too. You know, like as we are developing ourselves, like we're just always building on the uh, knowledge that we have acquired uh, previously, right? It's like, mm -hmm. it, the best should be yet to come because ultimately like every year that we learn new things, we have better tools at our disposal to uh, realize the projects that we have in our mind there. Mm -hmm. um, were there any particular challenges that you have met along the way? Like you have had a career that now spans over like 15 years, I think. Like I'm sure there were challenges along the way. There were like things that kind of happened uh, that were hurdles that you had to work to overcome you know like we all have these things in life was there anything like that that is worth to talk about i mean where to start i think you have a particular insight into it as you've been my boss and you've told me before that my whole learning process uh, surprised you uh and i think that's what i can bring to the people to the listener is that it's not character art is not something that came easy to me. Um, but I had a lot of people believing in me and uh, I just get, kept on working as a insanely hard worker before. And I think probably one of the first hurdle I had is I had a lead who told me um, a sign of insanity is uh doing the, what is it i think i have it characteristic of insanity is doing the same thing over and over while hoping for different results which is something i've never heard before and it had a, a big <laughs> in, impact on me so i worked really hard but i did not work smart and um i just i think not that that art was putting your headphones on and doodling and like hoping for the best and the talent was everything. And uh, I had to do from some serious soul searching um, and um, I had to uh, have more purpose to my work. I think that uh, our field of 3D is, can be overwhelming because as sculpting, it can be iterated and changed until uh, you, we can work on something indefinitely. And we have the rainbow of colors and materials and tools. 
And if we compare this to sculptors, traditional sculptors or painters who had like physical thing that they had to uh, worry about and uh, paint in like a restricted amount of colors, I think as an artist, I had to myself uh, rethink the way I was thinking and have more purpose. So be a better thinker. So, uh, and to me, it was note taking. So my brain is not strong enough to retain that, those, those information. So my discovery was about before starting something, you have to think about it. You have to visualize what you're about to do, why yeah. you're doing it. That is so and, true. Uh, yeah. yeah. So that's, and I'm still something I'm working on. So through all this, uh, I like to share what I'm going through, first of all, because it helps me kind of uh, putting it into motion. So when you see my art station, a character artist tips, they're all like things I've learned really, really difficultly and hoping that people can can have less of a hurdle than me through life if they, they if it makes sense to them. And I like that you are very forward with sharing tips as well. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like um, for someone to be able to put together so much interesting information and so thoughtful uh, takeaways for people to uh, sort of uh, learn from there. Like it shows that you had to go through that process yourself of learning all these things, mm -hmm. studying these things, thinking about these things, thinking in a context in which they are used and applied for you to be able to distill all of that information and to be um, able to express it afterward in such a great way here. So I think that like everyone has a lot to learn simply by going through your Art station page and just looking at the projects looking at what you have uh, written because you are very forward with sharing essentially like the fruit of that uh, labor mm -hmm. and i think that that's a great thing you know um so i do want to thank you for that uh, i think that you're, you're doing welcome. a great service to the world um but yeah like i i i, I also echo what you said about uh the need to or rather the benefit from taking time to think about things and really think like, okay, I want to do this or that, uh, you know, before I get started, why don't I take a time to just reflect through the process and see if there's anything uh, maybe about how I did this particular thing last time that I could improve, you know, like, uh, I think it's good to do that either. Like w after we're done, you know, like when I model something personally, like after I'm done modeling it, um, and I, I think that Marco too from uh, Chaos uh, said that at some point, and um, that was so true. I was like, "That's it," you know. Like uh, I actually heard it from him first, um, but then I realized I kind of did the same thing myself. And that people who like are good at learning things like usually do that, you know. Like you, you have to have uh, time for reflection somewhere in your process, mm -hmm. whether it's like before you start or after you're done with something, you just have to stop and just think about, okay, like, what did I do? What did I do right? What did I do wrong? What could I do better mm -hmm. next time? Or just think through like, okay, I wanna do this very complex thing. Which, which kind of path do I wanna to take to get there? Um, you know, I think that, you know, like we all think of course, but I think we all also stand to learn better ways of thinking that are more rewarding in, in terms of, of how much knowledge it kind of allows us to to um, absorb there. But, you know, like what I've learned through time, too, is that I've, I've taken a pleasure in learning things. I have mm -hmm. taken pleasure in the simple act of acquiring uh, knowledge, you know. Mm -hmm. And I do remember when I was like about 20, 25 years old, like for me, that was like, uh, I don't have time for that. It's like, I just I want to do stuff, you know, like I don't want to have to stop and study a book or something because it's like i would rather just just be more of a doer you know but like now i'm more of a thinker i kind of it's, feel as if my mentality there kind of changed throughout the years yeah it's maturity i think weirdly there's different kinds of being lazy but you can like instead of deciding to work on something really hard for 10 hours the same way you are doing takes less energy than to say okay, this is not working. My tools or my thought pattern is bad. I have to get back to it and then understand what is not working. And it's 
weirdly much easier to just continue like hitting hitting at the problem um that's being lazy weirdly being hard working sometimes can be very lazy if you're doing it the same way yeah yeah i mean it's lazy for the long term but it's not lazy yeah. for the short term so right yeah. now i'm in the thought pattern of how to uh, absorb information better so it's about um what am what am i about to do do it and then visualize it is it being able to close your eyes and visualize what you you just did and then it's about uh, uh correcting it looking at what doesn't work and then you sleep and then you do it again and that thing that's how you improve in life yeah 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 mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, like after I'm done sculpting something, there's like also like it's like the movie of me sculpting the thing kind of replays in my mind. And I kind of try to think through that of like, oh, like this maybe was not optimal. Maybe I should have That's used this brush cool. instead or something else. Queen's Gambit seeing the thunder. Exactly. Yeah. Actually, yeah. That's exactly sort of <laughs> like that there. Without the drug problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. I. I when we were working together at uh, IDAS uh, Montreal, mm -hmm. you I also saw you be extremely dedicated to figure drawing. Mm -hmm. Like more, you know, like that's kind of like the advice that we always give people who want to learn uh, 3D uh, character art if they don't have an artistic uh, background. It's like, oh, just go and just do uh, figure drawing for like a few years, you know, like uh, take that seriously while you are learning 3D on the side, of course. But mm -hmm. um it's like we give that advice to a lot of people and like i would say that probably like well i don't say that no one follows it but i'd say that most people never really get around to doing that including myself yeah. um but not you like i guess someone told you that at some point and it must have rang true for you within your soul because i saw you dedicate yourself to figure drawing and I could see you essentially throughout the years there. Like I, I saw your artistic knowledge develop itself and just blossom during those years that you were doing figure drawing. I mean, I assume you may still be uh, doing it. I don't know, but we don't work together. So of course we don't talk mm -hmm. on a daily basis now, but like I saw you develop yourself so much during that time and your skills had improved at a rate that was unbelievable during that time. So I don't know if you could say a few words on that. I mean, I saw, I've listened to the Magda interview and you asked the question, uh, is it important to draw as a 3D artist? And I mean, it's a lot of people are breaking that rule because Cedric and Marco do not draw and they're the best I know. Um, but it's to eat your own pet. Um, I like to, first of all, with the books in the back, like um, books are an immense way of uh, knowledge and I love them. And there's not a lot of books on sculpting because sculpting is really niche um, and it's because it takes a lot of involvement. I mean, uh, physical sculpting. So all those books on painting and drawing, they relate to sculpting in every ways and that was a way to absorb this information the same way understanding drawing means i can apply uh, this knowledge to sculpting also i don't know laura I, I think it's it's a really fast way to develop ideas uh, i still use drawing every day in my sculpt to push 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 it i feel like um you know treaty is really precious because we work so hard on it it's like dozens and dozens of hours and then you can take a, a screen in the and bring it in photoshop and then with some skills you can bring that rawness from brush strokes and then try to uh, integrate that back into your 3d model so i think that's an immense uh help um, of drawing uh with your sculpting so I'm not saying you should do it, but I think it's really helpful. And figure drawing, I mean, artists, uh, artists have been doing it for thousands of years, so they must be doing something right. It just helps you uh, observe things uh, 
more fully. Yeah, I think it develops your sense of observation really mm -hmm. well, but I do agree with you that it's, you know, one of the paths that you can take. It's not the only path, but it mm -hmm. is certainly a very good one for those who are motivated by that. Um, before we start to delve more into some of these pieces here, um, where can people follow you if they are interested in keeping, they want to know what the news are with uh, Guillaume Tiberguin and maybe the kind of art pieces that he is releasing? I mean, uh, ArtStation, I use my real name, so I think uh, you can follow me on ArtStation. You can follow me on Instagram also. You can try to friend me up on Facebook. I sometimes don't uh, accept it, except if you send me a little email or if I see a link. So sorry to those who I haven't accepted, but I also post my things on Facebook. Yeah, those three things. I don't yeah. get Twitter. Uh, so yeah, those three things. And LinkedIn like too. Do you accept requests on uh, LinkedIn? Yes. LinkedIn is whatever. Everything goes. Cool. <laughs> and uh, you don't have a shortage of uh, followers here if you're 12,000 followers. It's starting to get pretty big there. It's pretty cool. All right. Let's start to delve into some of these little pieces a little bit there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, because you do do stylized work, uh, like I take that as an occasion to really kind of try to talk a little bit about the difference between um, realistic 3D character art and stylized character art and try to really kind of deconstruct some stylized pieces to see, like, how do we go perhaps from realistic to stylized or yeah. something along those lines there. Um, so I'm quite interested to to start to break down some of these and really talk about like what makes your art style what it is really. Um, I don't know if there is any specific one here that you want to start with. Else I'll just oh, choose sure. a random one to just go to with your heart. Yeah. All right. I like. I really like this guy here. I love the proportions. Mm -hmm. I love what you did there. Like, but I I really like also like all in. Oh, I'm kind of thinking of punches now. Actually, I probably shouldn't do that. Um, yeah. Like I. I so if we were to try and define here, what is the Guillaume Tiberguin art style? Where would we start with that? I might not be the best judge of it, but I can say my intent for it. So uh, my style is um, expressive. I think I noted here, did I say? Expressive, vibrant, dynamic, um, First, purposeful, uh, colorful, yeah, and then so strong silhouette. Yeah, go on. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, because you're doing characters that are stylized, obviously you're not constrained by realistic proportions mm -hmm. and stuff like that, right? How do you like? How do you approach the topic of uh, proportions? Because like I can see proportions here that are very stylized, very interesting. Um, I kind of want to talk about that a little bit actually, and. Uh, like, so, so like, what's the thought process when you are creating different proportions or exploring a topic of proportions? Are there any kind of particular sort of mental processes that you use to kind of get to the result that you do? Like, how do you approach the whole topic of uh, proportions? I mean, I'm always going to start from realism. Um, you would think that what inspires me is other stylistic character, but I feel that I always have to go from a realistic and then uh, tone it down and simplify it. And it's a very, very long process because it's almost doing both things at the same time. So, um, you know, with this, I was about starting with a strong big man and then pushing it and pushing it uh, to almost breaking it and then pulling back and then pushing in. So um, all the muscle groups and all the all the fold theory and the color theory is, uh, is applied here. So I wish that with some time, I'll be able to go super simplify from the start, but I, I can't yet. I, there's a lot of work behind this, but what I can, what I I um, retain the most from that that character is color, like because you have you have all the primaries here, 
and yeah, it's yeah, really yeah. it's hard it's hard to um to put those three colors in the same piece yeah. and not get like gaudy and i i have it somewhere and i felt completely stuck and then i read a whole book i read confident colors or confident okay. color and after that i uh I was able to use those colors more boldly, but you'll you'll get this if we talk about other pieces more. They almost all broke me to a certain point, and then I had to like read a book or something. They always uh, there was a, a big big learning curve in each of those uh, pieces. Yeah, yeah. So there's one thing here about the proportions. Uh, I do find the colors to be very fascinating, too, and I definitely want to talk about that. Um, but there is one thing I'm kind of itching to point out here with proportions. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether this is something conscious or not. It could be just me reading into something here that is unconscious, or maybe it is uh, conscious. We haven't talked about this before, so it's going to be yeah. interesting to get your take on that. But on. Like, one thing that I really like about the character is that I feel as if like you know, like, the character is kind of... Um, um, there's this kind of expansion that is happening for the character at the middle section, like around the waist. It's like mm -hmm. everything is sort of enlarged, almost as if like you kind of went in there with like a, a um, like a bloat tool, you know, mm -hmm. um, in a way that's very interesting. Like when I look at the proportions, right, it's like the feet are like super, super, uh, well, they're probably not that far from realistic proportions perhaps, but I, f I have this feeling here that there's this kind of, like, if I place the knee here, it's kind of there. If I place a the pelvis, then it's kind of there. And, like, I feel as if the head, too, is, like, small. Like, like it's like the distance from the head to the shoulders is like this, but then the distance from the shoulders all the way to, uh, let's say, the pelvis is a lot bigger there. And the distance from the pelvis all the way to the knee is a bit shorter. And then the, mm -hmm. short, the distance from the knee to um ankle is like shorter as well like almost as if like you take the image of a person and you take a blow tool and you just like bloat out the uh like the middle portion of the character around the torso there so like the whole torso sort of enlarges and it pushes uh let's say the neck a bit further up than what you would have it pushes the proportions of the lower legs a bit further down i don't know if what i'm saying makes any sense to people or not but there's this kind of really nice sort of uh, um, bloating that kind of happens with the proportions around the waist that I find uh, fascinating. Bloating doesn't sound really good, but I'll, I'll take it. The thing I, I think is that when I look at that character more, I think that every good or a lot of uh, masterpieces uh, in the world comes from a very uh, simple geometry. So if you scroll back to the character, it's it's a triangle on the side. I think you can draw it. Um, I wish I can draw it, but it's a, you know, on the, on the right side is the straight line. And then from the head to the, is, is bow, uh, and then to the bow to the, the, the left foot, is another line, so there's a clear shape here, and it's not a perfect triangle. The, the apex of the shape is a bit lower, so I think maybe that's where the bloating comes from. But yeah, there's a there's a big uh, is there's a big uh, impact in the middle of the character, and that was yeah, purposeful. Yeah. yeah, and like I love to you all the silhouette breaks that you got. Like they're very explicit, you know, like mm. this here, like that. There's a bit of a break there. There's a bit of a break there. Like, it all seems very consciously controlled. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that I appreciate a lot. You know, like, like that's something that comes when we do only realistic uh, characters. We have a tendency to, like, flatten things a little bit. Like, we'll mm -hmm. have a garment, you, you know, like, kind of what I have right now. Like, if you guys look here, right, there's a bit of a silhouette break right now that's kind of created here. But we have a tendency to, like, often do things like this, yeah. you know, where uh, it's, like, cloth just sticks straight on to let's mm -hmm. say the body of a character and it often doesn't make a silhouette that's all that pleasing you know but here i can see some very uh some very well expressed very interesting angle breaks happening even the small things that you have here they kind of really like you know there's 
all these little spikes do you know there's like a lot of spikes and secondary shapes i feel like and that comes from what i was saying about drawing and painting over your work it's very hard to get it uh this extreme and bold uh in your silhouette breaks but if you if you take it in zebra uh, in photoshop and paint it over it's 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 almost like somebody else is correcting your, your piece you're gonna have like a second a, a fresh perspective on it and really like you saw my model before it's it's just keeping on pushing those points so i, I appreciate that you actually picked up on it yeah yeah all right let's talk about a different one should i give you a pick or you no, want me to choose just go which is more interesting if it's, you're doing all right let's talk about this one then right. i love the pose i love how expressive the pose is um yeah I, yeah you want to say a little bit about it i mean it's Serge Biro's work, so it was really cool to get to talk with him. And there's a hidden message in that piece that most of the people didn't get. But uh, yeah, it, uh, and it's interesting the, the, the ones you pick on, because uh, everybody only talks to me about Thor and Wonder Woman. So this one is old. I mean, it's the same process. Uh, what, what would be interesting would be to, I don't know if you can go on the reference. Uh, uh, is it's on this side. Or no, it's uh, on the, the on the right oh, corner. Sorry. Yeah, just go here. Let's roll down all that awesome mess. So yeah, that's his piece, and you can. I don't know if you can have them side by side, but it was cool because I talked with. I had a chance of talking with Serge uh, before doing that piece um, to pick his brain about it. And yeah, that's, that's really good. Let me get that going here. But yeah, I can continue talking. Usually I will uh, work with a concept artist and the fact that like uh, he was open to talk with me about his piece was really, really helpful. Um, so I told him, like, because I'm a maniac, sometimes when I do a pose, I'll do it myself to live it in my body. As an animator, I would always be acting everything. I would be an insane person. But I felt that, okay, look, so her right leg is up, and I feel that if there's a counterbalance, if you if you try try to imagine that pose, like it just did not make sense to me that her right arm would be in the back, or oh yeah 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 would be in the front, and then yeah, would, that swinging would uh, would be the opposite yeah 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 exactly. And then I asked him, yeah. feeling bad, and he's like, oh yeah, you're right. Just do whatever you want. Uh, and uh, yeah, no. Sometimes uh, you want to recreate a, a concept, and uh, if the concept artist is open to your uh, interpretation, then it's cool. It becomes a completely other model. Yeah, I do agree with that too. I think that like, you know, it's like concepts are really a stepping stone to creating the final uh, character. It's like the final mm -hmm. character is uh, a 3D representation of a 2D uh, concept, but. It's like the moment that you jump in 3D, you know, like you start to um, question certain things that the person who did the concept doesn't really have to think about, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and, you know, just the pose, you know, like there's a lot of cheating that can happen as far as 2D concepts are concerned. Um, and once you do a jump to 3D, you realize like, oh, wait, this thing here looks really great on the concept. It works really good. I understand why the concept artist drew it that way, but this can't work in 3d for some reason because of the pose because of the construction because of the volumes of the character you can't cheat as well you know and that's um, fine because they spent five hours maybe on it as we're gonna spend like two well, months ten times yeah exactly yeah pretty much you know yeah 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 and like people who do concept art in uh the video game industry especially in different studios like uh, um 
they're so overworked, you know, and like there's so much on their shoulders to at the start of a production often, you know, because they're essentially a, um, they're like at the start of the production chain, you know, it's like before them, pretty much the only thing that happens is just developing the bio of a character and the art direction there. So people who do concept art, um, they have a lot of pressure on their shoulders at the start of a production when you have so many different teams that need to be fed data and they really don't have the privilege of being able to contemplate every little detail that they draw, you know, like for them, it's a lot more important to just uh, sort of draw out what is the essence of the character, what is the essence of the pose, um, and really communicate an intent as to what the character should look like. But, you know, like they don't have the time, they don't have the privilege to be able to figure out every little detail, you know? So when we do character art, three character art, it, it's good to really keep that in mind, you know? Like if there's something that, we think is a mistake on a concept art. It's probably just like that because the concept artist just really just did not have the time that he really would have wanted to be able to fix all mm -hmm. these small things left and right. Mm -hmm. So when we do 3D character art, we have to think through these things. We have to look at details. And if they don't make sense, we don't have to, we have to not be afraid to bring them up, to talk about them, to propose changes that would be to the benefit of the character. It's really a group effort. In the in the perfect world, you have a great relationship with a a concept art a artist that uh, is not married to these ideas and is ready to uh, grow from it. Yeah, yeah. It mm -hmm. feels to me here too that you have overemphasized the pose even more. Yeah, that's really cool. I really mm -hmm. love what you did. It's like you've really exaggerated the pose, and I think it works really wonderfully. Uh, Wait a second. I'm not drawing anything. Oh. Yeah, so I really yeah. love how you really like overemphasize. There's this whole thing of like big C, like like open C, closed C uh, mm -hmm. in animation circles. I don't know if you want uh, if you can talk about that a little bit because I can kind of see this here a little bit, and I find that very interesting. Well, I I, I haven't read like your animation books. I should get to it but it's almost if she was in a more extreme pose like the concept is almost a, a in between animation but there's a clear yeah there's a clear c on her starting from her head to her left foot yeah that's that's the curve i'm always looking for when i start something it always has to follow a very clean um geometrical shape or a line and that it comes back for, to light drawing what you just did like line that's the first thing you do usually when you're about to draw somebody and yeah, then you yeah, draw yeah. the head and the hips and the, the the rib cage and then you go from there yeah so the idea of the open c to closed c and stuff like that is that um you know like if you want to do like highly expressive pose and you know like this is more of an animation thing at this point but you know it's that sort of idea that like if you want to like make a pose extremely expressive kind of exaggerated you want to go from this kind of open c which is kind of what you have here this this i mean it's not really a c at that point but you guys will see what we call that uh a c in uh just a second you know like this kind of very like highly open exaggerated kind of uh pose here and i can just imagine her like kicking the head, you know, or kicking uh, the helmet. And then she would go from this extremely sort of open, um, um, sort of arcing back line, you know, that looks like this to a line that looks like this, you know, just mm -hmm. the closed C, you know, mm -hmm. like she goes from like one extreme to, uh, to the other one. And you can really kind of see the momentum in her uh, gesture right now. And I find that really, really uh, beautiful. Um, My work is I, done, yeah. <laughs> One thing I also like, uh, it's kind of a little bit here in the concept, but you have also sort of overemphasized it here. And that I really like, like, it's a, it's a subtlety that you can really only do if you're doing stylized uh, characters. I feel like, like you're even bending the actual limbs themselves. You know, like if we look at the, <laughs> at the leg here, like it's not straight. It's like, there's an actual kind of sausagey bend to the leg that I really like. I mean, hopefully, their right. leg or leg is straight, but the momentum of the the fabric that is not rigid is actually what would give it to this. But yeah, it's it's pushed. It's too extreme. 
like she had like rubbery bones. I didn't ever saw it that way. But it's working, I think. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, I, I think it's actually working uh, wonderfully. I also like that you have uh, angle changes, if you will, that happen um, at places where it makes anatomical sense, you know? Like, mm -hmm. and I really don't want to in any way suggest that sales work uh, is of a lower uh, quality because I really don't think that it is there. But, you know, here there is a gradual kind of almost lazy like, and I mean uh, lazy here in, in the terms yeah. of, uh, in sense of a lazy curve. Um, not that Serge was uh, lazy, because I know that he is anything but that. Mm -hmm. um, but there is here, you know, like the curve is very gradual throughout the whole body. You don't, you can't really see any point that uh, anatomically makes sense for the body to be twisting a bit more uh, mm -hmm. or be uh, curving a bit more. And you really like have this section here on the torso that is a bit like it's curvy, but it's a bit straighter. And then you have the leg here, which is also curvy, but it's a bit straighter. And there's an angle change that happens at the pelvis, which is a bit more abrupt than we have elsewhere. And I find that really, really beautiful. I mean, I'm looking at both. I really, I really like his work too. I'm finding new things that, but I think it, for him, it was a stylistic change uh, or felt, I think it was a clear choice. Uh, into his uh, continuous uh, cylindrical shape that's very pleasing to me. But yeah, it's it's fun to look at them uh, with a few years of, of reflection on it. Yeah, yeah. All right. Let's look at what else you got in here. I love this one. I'm kind of afraid of talking about it a little bit. Uh, yeah, we'll there's a we'll lot talk about it later. Because there's a lot going on. Oh, you want to save that one for uh, later? Uh, yeah, let's that. keep this one for later. Uh, Okay, okay, okay. All right, all right, all right. Interesting. Uh, yeah, you have, um, I find that you have interests that um, are not interests that are necessarily very common for people who do 3D uh, character art. And I like to see that, you know, like uh, character art, you know, like we often think of uh, character art in the context of production art, mm -hmm. uh, which is what happens when we do games, when we do movies, these sorts of things, but like ultimately really 3D character art is, uh, is an artistic uh, medium the way that any other uh, medium are, right? But like a lot of the work that we see on ArtStation is like always things that would insert itself very well in a video game as a video game uh, character somewhere. Um, but you have these interests, you have these, um, yeah, just these you're you seem to be interested when you do 3d character art i think that uh, magdalena also has that a little bit that like i feel as if there is a desire to make art for the sake of art and not just to make art to have nice portfolio pieces that represents what you could do in a production environment mm -hmm. and i find that this one is very fascinating because like this isn't the kind of topic that i think most people who do 3d character art would choose you know and i think that that's something that's all to your advantage really I mean, that shows something typically me, which is my love of, of dancing. And back at IDOS, I, I would dance every night of the week. Uh, so that was something I could show of, uh, of myself. So I think I wanted to talk about it later on, but I think what will make your art uh, stand, stand out is what, your other interests are other than maybe video games. And if you can bring your love of engineering or I don't know, cooking or whatever model making, uh, you can bring this into your art and that's gonna, that's gonna be very, very, uh, memorable to, for your work. So that's what I brought this. I was lucky because that Johannes made that drawing just for me so it was it was a whole uh, contribution thing super cool yeah mm -hmm. super cool so how important is it for someone who does 3d uh, character art or just art in uh, general to find their own creative voice to find their own topics that they like uh or to represent things in a way that is unique to them that's a that's a big question i think you can you have to show what you care about because it, that's what people are going to react to. 
I don't, I think you can try, some people try to play the game and like mold their uh, portfolio to uh, the companies they want to work for. And I think that can easily backfire. I think your artwork has to be sincere in the end. And even though I know it's hard, probably a lot of you listening are like struggling students and want to do it and just want to get in the industry. Um, any way possible uh i think you're gonna be recognized uh for your own voice really so you have to trust it uh at the same way you have to uh be worried about things that are overly sexualized or violent i'm not telling you not to do it i'm just saying that you might like restrict where you can go from there. But uh, if I'm to uh, be of any like example, I, I really, really be believe in my vision and it's starting to pay off uh, in the end. Yeah, I That's I think we have a tendency to remember, you know, like every artist I could think of right now that does 3D uh, character art just off the top of my head. If I just name a few randomly that just appear in my mind, I'm thinking of uh, Furio uh, Tedeschi, let's yeah. say. Um, he's got a unique style to him, you know? Mm -hmm. And like mm -hmm. everyone I can point to that are memorable to me as people who do 3D character art all have their own unique style. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, like, I think that that's one of the most important thing for us to sort of really break away from what everyone is kind of uh, doing to be remembered so that people will also keep us in the back of their mind uh, when they are looking for someone to hire for a particular role. Um, if you stand out, because what you're doing is a little different than what everyone else is actually doing, either in terms of style, either in terms of techniques that you use, um, you're actually making, I think that you are making yourself more interesting for people to hire because then you are bringing a voice to the table. You're bringing an art style, you're bringing an expression, you're bringing knowledge of tools that other people won't have on a production. Mm -hmm. And I think that that makes you more hireable. That makes you more desirable as someone to work on a production. Um, yeah, there's, while I'm looking at this, by the way, uh, something that you are mentioning here is that this was a great learning experience in simplicity. Yeah. Could you talk a about that a little bit? Okay, this one is so... I mean, look at her arms. Like, they're basically tubes. Uh, her legs, like, everything is so simple and... Uh, they're pure, you know, of the apex of a shape, you see uh, all the muscle, hopefully, or the bone structure are there to their simplest um, expression. Uh, I think I think I said that mostly because that, that piece I really found myself in. It's like a start of a new thing. If you see that the, the work I did before was a robot with a with a lady is completely different yeah or the star wars thing the tutorial was much more realistic i was working at ubisoft back then uh, i mostly think it's because i i made it much more uh realistic at first mm -hmm. and then i had to tone it down and tone it down and tone it down and find the curves so, um, yeah, I think it was just the start of a, a, a new kind of uh, me coming into my own. Uh, I, I can't think of very specifics because it's too, it's too far. But uh, Is that hard, though? Like, is that something that is hard to do? Because like, I assume that probably doesn't come to us naturally, the idea of reducing details, making things mm -hmm. more simple. You know, like there's a lot of creative... But, but then you can't reduce everything either because then you just wind up having everything that's just perfect cylinders. Like It's like yeah. you need to reduce when you're doing stylized work. It seems to me like you, you need to simplify things. You need to reduce things, but you also need to kind of ask yourself a question. What shape, what line, what silhouette break is really important, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's, mm -hmm. it's like mm -hmm. it kind of probably, I guess, forces you to 
sort of even maybe um, put some order in the uh, own uh, knowledge that you have to remove the noise from there and really kind of yeah. find what it is about a particular shape that really makes it like that, you know, and remove everything else that is unnecessary. Yeah, I've been talking about really like rationalizing things, but there's still, I think, this 67% that is like involuntary and just muscle memory and just feeling. And I think at some point you have to learn everything very well so that you can let go and trust your instincts. I think, and I think that piece particularly was a lot of instincts. And what I can remember about, about that piece in particular is Weirdly, you spend dozens and dozens and dozens of hours on a piece. And then I feel like in the last five hours, there's just the little magic thing that's going to happen or not. And you have to find it. And it's very, very hard. And I yeah, think yeah, yeah. if I remember correctly, um, with this one, the magic, if there's any, I don't know if you can zoom in a bit. Oh, sure. I can try that. Uh... Let me do that here. It's like I just turned her face a bit more to be like laying more on his chest. And then there's the light that it's like just a bit of her lip. So we're not even talking about modeling anymore. We're talking about modeling, but with, with light, maybe it just moved the light. And it just made the whole thing uh, come into his own. I hope so. Me, what I really like is her, uh, her left, her left wrist, like the way she broke her, her, her wrist. There, and, uh, it's it's fun because I look at it more as a viewer now. I don't even remember doing it, but I mean, yeah, I haven't I haven't explored dancing that much recently, and I should get back to it. But yeah, it's those tiny things. So you have to trust. That, you have to remember that. You can change it till the end. You shouldn't always uh, put your stuff in question, but often at the end, there's little things that you can change that are going to have a big impact. And often you're not going to be the one who's going to uh, be the best judge of this. You have to show mm -hmm. it to people. And I think it's by showing it to people. I think people reacted a, a certain way. They didn't tell me her head should be turned as a a certain way, but somebody told me something that made me do this in the end. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's weird, right? It's like, I have no trouble judging someone else's work, but I can't judge my work for the life of me. It's like, I, I can't. It's like, every time I try and I fail miserably at it. Tunnel vision. We all are facing this, so show your work. Yeah. Everybody. And like, even when I look at an artistic piece that I have done um, either the day before or sometime in the past, right? It's like, I feel if enough time has passed, then I'm like you, I'm like, suddenly I'm able to judge it a bit, a bit better. Um, mm -hmm. I'm able to have more of an objective sort of uh, appreciation for my own work. But in the moment, it's impossible. Yeah. It's like, I also need other people's uh, opinion to uh, uh, tell me things. Makes me feel better to hear that from you because I feel the same. Yeah, sometimes I wonder, is like, is it just me or is it just like, like, like are we all like that? I'm sure there's tricks. I'm sure we could read a book about how you can always like mix things up so that you always keep a fresh perspective by flipping the image upside down or things like this. Yeah, yeah there are tips like this that. In mind. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit harder to, to do this when you do 3D character art, but mm. you can't just flip your ZBrush canvas. Uh, I, I, I guess you could marry the model, of course. Uh, if you're working in Dynamish, I guess it's not too hard. If you have subdivision levels, good luck doing that. Um, how So the whole topic of like artistic interests and stuff, you know, like I find that sometimes I talk to people and I feel as if they kind of struggle a little bit to develop their own artistic, to cultivate their own art artistic interests. I think that like that's especially important when you do stylized work because it is all about artistic expression, really. You know, so I do think that like absorbing kind of um, either uh, takeaways or uh, just artistic 
kind of inspiration from left and right from mm -hmm. different people who do 3d art or other stuff or just art in uh, general doesn't have to be 3d in uh, nature there like really helps when you're doing stylized stuff um how do you feel as if uh, do you have any ideas as to how people can better cultivate their own artistic interests well, I, I spoke about it a bit. I think that uh, you have to cultivate um, anything other than 3D or video games to find your own distinct voice. So uh, that be sports or yeah, yeah. playing an instrument, going outside, looking at nature, uh, having a balanced life, uh, reading seeing your friends, exchanging ideas, uh, yeah, literature. Uh, I don't have a clear uh, idea for you, but... Um... Well, I think you said it's like, I think getting inspiration from outside of 3D character is very, very important. You know, like, if, we, if, if all we do is look at our station all day, and I mean, there's some great work there, but Mm -hmm. if that's the only thing that we consume really you know like we run the risk of just making art just the way that everyone else has done art before you know, you know like i don't personally believe that we can just look at a blank page and just imagine something new that never existed you know like i think that we are always kind of piecing together um inspirations from left and right and that pretty much everything that can be invented probably already has you know but yeah. what we may not have invented yet is a particular recipe a particular mix a particular flavor of something you know um but it's, so that bringing, you... it's bringing two ideas together it's, yeah it's not nothing has not everything has been made before but you can always mix things uh and you're talking about art looking at art station all day i feel like we're almost oversaturated with amazing content now that um you almost have to restrict what you're consuming um to be inspired, really. I mean, there's a saying also saying garbage in, garbage out. Like, I feel like if you want to do good art, you have to surround yourself with smart, intelligent, positive people and content uh, to be able to produce the same thing. Yeah, yeah. But just a peek behind the curtain, like we, me and Laura met yesterday and she ask me what were my inspiration and for the life of me i couldn't say like i love this artist i i picked this from this and that movie from that it's all very organic so i'm not the i'm not the best judge of where to find inspiration probably i should think about it more yeah but i like that you don't necessarily stop yourself either at uh, anything that is directly related to 3d uh, character mm -hmm. art you know it's like mm -hmm. inspiration for you like dancing is a source of inspiration and i find that really fascinating because you're kind of you have a love for uh dancing and certainly that gets you to think about poses probably a lot more than uh the average person i think that yeah. that's very visible through the pieces that you're doing in your portfolio it's like practically everyone in here has an interesting pose to them um and so you know like whereas people who don't necessarily cultivate other interests, other hobbies. Um, you know, like the only thing that they'll think about is, oh, I want to do a character. I guess I'll just do it in uh, T-Pose because it's the only thing that we know how to do, really. But mm -hmm. the moment that like you kind of start to bring like dancing into the mix, now suddenly it's like your brain is used to thinking about how to place your body in a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure that, you know, like that has a direct impact to the kind of work that you do afterward, you know? so. I 100% fully agree that um, it's good to bring in sources of inspiration that come from the outside of 3D art, you know? It's mm -hmm. like, personally, myself, like, I'm super, like, people who uh, watch uh, this pretty much every week, they know that I'm completely and utterly absorbed or rather uh, obsessed by uh, Tenet, uh, the movie. And, uh, you know, I watched this, I watched it so many times, I've like paused it on so many frames i've kind of reflected upon a lot of the choices that went in there into creating the movie you know it's like i consider now that i have absorbed a uh, tenet uh, as as part of my own artistic kind of vocabulary almost you know and like right. it's it really inspires everything now you know like whether it's it's often unconscious but it's like we the art that we do is built upon 
all the knowledge that we have acquired before and that goes much further beyond just uh, knowledge in terms of tools you know it's like also yeah. knowledge in terms of interests in terms of what makes things interesting isn't that movie like 30 dollars to rent you must have spent so much money on this no i just bought the movie at that point uh, there you go because like i'm like this is a christopher uh, nolan movie and i typically like these i'm like i want to buy this one so i bought yeah. it so i good i'm looking forward to it. watch it I wish we could have seen it. And You're gonna hate it. Yeah. <laughs> no, I love I love Christopher Nolan movies. My wife hates them, but I always find them fascinating. I just can't hear what they're saying, but that's that's this thing. Warm yeah, but it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. It's like a lot of people can fight about it. It's like I don't mind it. Like I think like those are just creative decisions that he took. I think mm. where he really wanted to just emphasize like the movie, the mood more than the actual vocabulary mm -hmm. of people. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, for sure that movie is controversial uh to say the least um do you have anything to recommend to people either like in terms of movies books trip to the museum persons to follow to sort of help them also develop their own interests yeah how long do we have okay so i i got it down to three books okay if there's one to recommend is um the Practice in Science Drawing from uh, Harold Speed. It's a really, really old book. It's like That's 1915. It's a, a book. Are there no, words and errors, or is it just pictures? No, it's, a, it's just words. It's an There's art lesson. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, it's, All right. uh, it's a fascinating book. I've, it's a book I've read and reread. Uh, it's very it's 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 an art uh it's an it's art university and it's it's a really really known book and it's kind of funny because um it's early 20th century so it's people who did like really realistic paintings when the uh, advent of photography came and then you no know, the public was like I I'm not gonna get my portrait paint i can get it the realistic thing uh paint uh, like to take a picture of it and you can clearly make some links with this with scan technology or um plot simulation and you know what artists are still there a uh, hundred years later and it's a very very relevant book only for that but there's a lot of other things about lines and flow and chunking and like like you were saying nothing has been uh, invented so if there's one book to recommend is this one for anatomy you have the figure drawing from michael empton i don't know if this might not that that might be more for um, figure drawing but there's a simplification of shapes uh that is uh really helpful to me uh you know comparing muscle groups uh to other things like the, the gluteus is like a butterfly and now that when i try to think of picturing that muscle i think butterfly and then i can picture it better oh these are so it's all, good. It's, yeah. it's all there it's yeah is that it's online beautiful. that's that mind blowing yeah it's probably a preview of it uh well no, i don't know it's... it looks like the full book actually it's, I don't know. Yeah, I just googled it for the first time. Like, I don't know whether so, this is I mean, legal or not. Be, <laughs> it'd be stupid. Everything, well, all the knowledge oh is there. God. Yeah, it's crazy good. It's wow. These are crazy good drawings. So you know, I also have like all the anatomy for for sculptors that are, uh, you know, more thorough in their way of thinking. But this one really, really helped me into. Uh, uh, having a, a visual a visual uh, interpretation of everything yeah, yeah. no they're like wow this is crazy i need to i'm glad if you didn't know I that agree. book then you get did not know this book yeah awesome you said you had a third one there as well yeah uh and then for colors and uh and lighting and everything else is color and light i think a lot of people know this book james, james gurney Gern. he's on He's on Instagram. He's a fascinating man. Uh, 
you know, and all those people, they come from before uh, computers, so they had to figure it out with real paper, and, and I have a profound respect for this. I think we have a lot to understand. The same with Loomis, like anything Loomis is, uh, is magnificent. So, I mean, there's a lot of other books, but I try to take three of them that are like very uh, specific to their fields. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Super cool. Yeah. Awesome. All right. All right. Let's uh, change topics a little bit. Um, right. We want to talk also about things that are um, maybe a bit more practical for you guys who are listening to this and uh, um, who are either working in video game studios now or would like to work in video game studios and have a bit of a kind of wonder how things are there. Uh, I, I think there's some interesting things to talk about there. Um, I'm really interested by your uh, career, uh, Guillaume, because now you are in a position where you are managing people, mm -hmm. right? So you've kind of transitioned over from being someone who's just an artist on the team, uh, and now you are essentially managing people. I take it that likely has changed your day-to-day -day significantly, um, mm -hmm. but it may also maybe have brought you to appreciate the role of being a leader a bit more and... I'm sure that there's a lot of difficulties there that are inherent to that um, that are worth to talk about there. But, uh, you know, like I, I always thought of you as a really extremely nice person. You're just extremely nice as a person. Like you've always been super nice. You're super humble. Um, I really have only great things to say as far as your personality is concerned. But I do take it, I do imagine that being a manager probably also um, has its own challenges, whether you are a nice person or not, it doesn't mean that you're necessarily a good uh, manager, you know? So, mm -hmm. um, like, what makes a leader be a good leader? And just to say, it's not being, being nice and being soft is not always going together. So you have to, yeah, that's all I was saying. So what did you say? What is a, a... say that question again? Um, what makes, what a, good makes a good manager or a good uh, manager? That's yeah. a good question. Uh, I'm really early in my stage of uh, being a manager. I think, I think a manager is a patient person. I think, I think to be able to manage people, you have to be able to have done the work of managing yourself first. So you have to be a stable person, a humble person. Um, I think you need good communication skills uh, with the client and going back to your artist. I think you have to know your team really well, their strengths and their weaknesses. Um, I think you have to shield uh, your team from anything hurtful they might experience. I'm sure you did that at IDAS and you know what I mean. You have to cocoon your, your art team to be able to they make the best art possible. Um, and lastly, I think that uh, you have to be able to understand the vision of the client, uh, the visual style, what works, what doesn't. And when something doesn't work, you have to be able to explain that in uh, precise words. And I hope that's what I'm offering. I don't want to, I don't want to bag on people before me, but I still feel like video games somehow is an old industry, but it's still very young. And I've heard a lot of criticism saying like, make it more badass. And I, <laughs> I Sorry, don't know. I don't know what, what to what do does that with mean? that. Yeah, yeah like, well, I don't know what mean? that means. And I've heard that, and I think I'm trying to break the stereotype. So if the client doesn't, if the, it's fine if the client wants this, but me as a manager, I have to bring this information and then to give the tools to the artist to understand. I might not understand it yet, but will give some precise uh, ways to be able to solve that problem. And yeah, it's about being patient. It's about being honest. Like if I can 
extract what I've learned from being a manager. You have, such, you have to have a really good, honest relationship with the client and with the artist and just doing your best. And like, you have to accept failure. That's a really North American way of thinking, but people are going to fail. You have to fail forward. So when something is hard, you have to be, you have to be proactive. You have to go to your your leader and say, I don't understand this, or I messed up. I'm sorry. Let's move on. Like that's the best thing I think you can do. Uh, that's one of the things that you look into someone, right? Yeah. 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 You when you're a, yeah. looking for someone to join your team, you're like, okay, like is this person uh proactive, I suppose? Yeah. You have to be, yeah, yeah, you have to be forthcoming with with uh with your issues, yeah, you have to be truthful. Yeah, I think so too. I think one of the worst things that we can do as a leader is to sh uh, is to uh, chastise people. You know, to like yeah. if someone makes a mistake, to make them feel as if, um, to make them feel. I mean, you have to make it so that people will will learn from that mistake, of course. But at the same time. As a leader, you have to understand that, you know, everything that we know in life, everything, even the ways that we think, uh, we have learned these things through life, you know? It's like every word that goes through your mind is a word that you have learned. Every phrase that you put together is a phrase that you have learned at some point. It's like, you know, through, like, without the process of learning, we are babies. And it means that if you're a leader, even if something for you seems like it is something that is very obvious, if someone hasn't explicitly learned that thing before, they just won't be able to put that into practice. You know, mm -hmm. that's very normal. It's like you, mm -hmm. we have to be understanding with uh, people learning things. We have to give people the leeway to make um, to make uh, mistakes. You know, and we have to make it so that people are allowed to do uh, mistakes. You know, and that they. Um, don't necessarily suffer a consequence when they do one of these, you know, yeah. like if someone does a mistake, it's like, sure, you want to mention it to them so that they don't do it again. But at the same time, people have to know that they are allowed to make those uh, mistakes. I think that's, something that's very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you don't foster that kind of, that kind of um, spirit on your team, then you have people who are going to do mistakes and then, they'll be afraid of the punishment that's going to come with that. And then they will simply try to sweep that under the rug, you know? Yeah. And that's going to yeah. lead to all sorts of problems down the line. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it also just doesn't lead to a team that is very cohesive and mm -hmm. um, nice to work with. Like, so we've touched about this a little bit, but like what else are you looking for when you're looking for someone to join your team? Like for people out there right now who are looking for a job and are kind of wondering like, okay, like I'd like to break into the games industry. I'd like to get a job there. What kind of advice can you give people that are looking to get a job to do 3d character art? What is it that a leader would be looking in, in them? Let's say when they're going through an interview or something. That's a big question. Um, yeah, because you are, I think I'm looking at your question. I think you mixed up, two, you or you mixed two questions. I'm not sure how to answer. Oh, I do that all the time. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> they're really big questions. So uh, if you don't mind, I think I'll I'll break them up and oh, yeah, answer go them go the way yeah. you're. So you were saying, what does a leader look for in a team member? Yeah, uh, or if someone is going through an interview, looking for a job, yeah. what kind of tip can you give them? What will someone pay attention to when they are interviewing them? Oh my God, that's a big question. And I don't, I have to say, I don't interview people at Chaos Mason. I can just uh, talk from experience. So I, I'm going to say that um, weirdly, there's a big disconnect between uh, the quality or portfolio and the the them as production artists uh it often doesn't uh give you an answer uh and sometimes you're really disappointed um 
So it makes me feel that there, it's two skills. You can have your own personal work, but can you work under the pressure of the production and the client and uh, a deadline? So I think at this point, it's probably uh, a wise thing to have tests. And I think more and more companies are doing it. And it's a lot of investment for you. I understand it. But I think it tells us a lot of things. Um, so I think there's a lot of things I can't really tell until uh, I'm working with them. Uh, but you need somebody, I think we're going to repeat it. Uh, you need somebody who's going to persevere. Like you need somebody who's not going to drop the ball when it gets hard, because it's going to get hard. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And you need to have something that I appreciate is that I work with big teams. So somebody that's uh, available and generous, doesn't have an ego, ready to uh, share their knowledge and help people around them finding solutions is a really beneficial. Um, you really have to be open to uh, things are going to suck. I'm sorry to not express it another way, but we don't all come in perfect from the start. You're going to have a lot of revisions to do. And you have to accept them and do them to your best. And yeah. even think when things are hard, if there's something to 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 get from our three hours talk, is just don't take things personally. I know it's yes. hard. Yes. I I'm not listening to my own advice right now, but <laughs> I mean, but I fully agree with you, though. Yeah. I mean, you just can't feel destroyed by it, and you just have to keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Going yeah. and going. And, you know, at some point when it's really, really difficult and you feel like you're going to, gonna like, explode, it, it's, the, it's the curve of knowledge, you know. It's the, it's the dip before there's a big learning curve. So you have to know that in the future when you're going to think back to this, it's gonna, there's going to be a lot of good... Uh, so I'm not sure I'm answering your question well, but um, well, we're, we're sort working. Of with, yeah, we're working with humans. We have to remember it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think you're kind of circling around the topic of emotional uh, maturity, really. Yeah. And I think that that's very important. You know, it's like you want people who are emotionally mature. You want people who feel like they they want to dedicate themselves to something greater than even just character art. I would say. You know, it's like you want people who also take a certain pleasure and a certain satisfaction in making whatever it is that your company is uh, doing, really. If you're making a video game, you want someone who also kind of puts that forward a little bit, um, isn't just doing work, character art for their own sake because it's important to them, but it's also important to them to make a, a bigger product, you know? Because like when you work in a video game studio, I feel as if there is always a bit of that tension between I could do this, which will give me a better portfolio piece for my character, or I could do this, which will lead to a better experience for the player. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, and these two things are not always one and the same. Um, and uh, I think that people who make the best artists on a team are those who are able to detach themselves from their own personal interests. Um, and they're really able to think about the whole that you are doing. What is the greater product that you are contributing to? Yeah. But also like you've mentioned something that I think is so incredibly true, which is that if you really want to survive in a video game studio or probably any um, artistic uh, job for that matter, because like who says something artistic says something that is subjective. And when you start talking about things that are subjective, you, you uh, by definition, everyone experiences it a bit differently. Um, so, you know, everyone will look at the art that you make differently. Some people will like the art that you do. Other people will think it's shit. That will always happen no matter how good you are. Um, and everyone will be somewhere on that spectrum. And um, everyone will always have a bit of a different opinion, will have a bit of a different thing to say about your art. And you have to get into a mentality where you acknowledge what people say, because there often is some interesting things in there, but you don't necessarily always um, feel as if what everyone is saying has to be taken as law. You know, like you can oh, have man. your own opinion as to what other people say, but you have to be able to take that criticism. You have to be able to take that feedback 
and uh like this is me starting in video game studios when i didn't know these things like uh my lead or my boss back then would like give me feedback which sometimes was very much on point but i wasn't always in a mental space that i was ready to accept that feedback and i would just get like really frustrated you know um because i'm like no but they don't understand what is the creative vision that i'm going for here or something like that you know like we sort of make up all these kind of stories you know i had to learn and life became so much better for me when i always kind of had that idea of yeah like i want to fully dedicate myself to my art but at the same time i always want to detach myself emotionally from my art or from what i do in a production environment enough in that production yeah that if someone criticizes the work that i do like it, it hasn't just completely ruined my my whole day there you know um oh my god I think that's it's a big so... challenge of working in video game studios yeah that's so interesting. It's it's really great to have your input on this. And as a, my personality is always going to blame myself instead of others. But who knows what the rest of the team or the leaders have in their head. And it might be just agenda. There might be... Who knows? And I've attached so much importance to their opinion and like you're saying often they are just opinions they are they're your superiors so and hence they're in a way right and you have to follow what they're saying but that doesn't make them always right or yeah, the yeah. detaching and i mean i'm saying this but i'm gonna fail at what we're trying to preach right now over and over again it's, and it's okay oh me too me too yeah for sure yeah it's not easy but yeah. uh, at least when we have an idea of what is the ideal situation i suppose mm -hmm. it helps to work towards that mm -hmm. yeah yeah well you know as a leader we also have to be keenly aware of that it's like everyone also has a different um i guess resistance to um negative feedback i suppose um and as leaders, this is definitely something that we definitely keep on the back of our minds, I think, you know, like, yeah. who is this person that we deal with? How well do they receive feedback? And you always kind of try to um, adapt your approach based on the individual there. So you have to understand that usually you will be judged not only on the quality of your portfolio, but almost 50-50 with your attitude because you have to be a person to work with you have to take feedback and it's you have to want to keep growing so yeah work on your portfolio but also you have to work on yourself a lot too yeah 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 i mean it helps to ask feedback of other people uh friends or other people that you meet on like uh, discord forums or something like that um i think that helps to kind of try and get used to the blow of receiving negative feedback a little bit um sounds hard it's not easy as yeah. you certainly know um, <laughs> yeah but i think it helps you know like it helps to to you know like when an art director or someone who is a you know a superior to you asks you to do something mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that you have to be in agreement with it to do it either you know it's like i think that ideas should be debated if ever we have objections that we think are very worthwhile and that certainly are worth to be uh, mentioned but mm -hmm. you know like ultimately working in a team also means that the end result is the result of everyone's input you know which means that there too there will be things that you don't necessarily agree with um but if you don't emotionally attach yourself to your work too much i think it's easier to say like okay well i don't necessarily agree with that but um that's what they want and you know they're very adamant about this so let's just do it this way like me doing it doesn't mean that i necessarily have to agree with it as much as you know but if you don't agree with something i think one of the challenges you're working in a video game studio is that it's fine that you don't agree with something but if let's say art direction is very adamant about something you still have to do your best possible implementation of that exactly so if you don't understand something and you disagree with it it's best to um it's best to talk about it with your superiors and to have them 
explain it in their own words and from there um, do your best with it. I think the worst you can do is think, I don't get it, it's gonna be shit that I'm gonna do, you know, bad work. You really have to be uh, stepping on that mentality and trying to find in your own logic how you can bring their vision. Because, uh, yeah, you're, you're going to die inside if you just end up, like, oh shutting God. yourself. And then Definitely, and I've, yeah. I've seen that happen too many times. And it's yeah, not yeah. going to... Yeah. It, it, they're not going to be happy at the end. You're gonna, not going to be happy. And, uh, yeah, it's uh, another big uh, question or debate. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, glad I didn't. I didn't think we were gonna talk about that, but this is super interesting. Yeah, yeah. I like to where this conversation has uh, taken us. You know, and like yeah. on the topic of like interviews, like uh, so, like you haven't necessarily interviewed that many people, but mm -hmm. uh, I personally have interviewed quite a lot of people. And the more I I I interview people, the more I realize that I focus solely on the individual during the interview process, and. You know, because like usually when you go into an interview, you've already looked at someone's portfolio, you've already looked at their LinkedIn, you've looked at their resume. It's like you know that they can do the job just based off what's there, you know, yeah. uh, from a technical standpoint. And if you didn't know that they can do the job, well, it's just, you know, maybe they're not worth your time to be, uh, you know, to, um, to just, uh, yeah, to just have a call with them. So yeah. like usually when you have an interview with someone, it's because you've already kind of mentally validated that they're able to do a job. And like, mm -hmm. I find that like the most important thing that I usually focus on when I interview people is just, what do I want to work with them? Yeah. It's like, are they someone I would like to spend my days with working together? Would we get along? Will they get along with the rest of the team too, of course, you know? Um, mm -hmm. But I see a lot of people, especially juniors, when they come into an interview, they think that it's all about proving their skills. You know, it's like, oh, I know Maya, I know this, and it's like, it's like we don't usually care about which software you know. You know, it's like we care that you're able to do good content, that you're able to produce good uh, character art. And in certain cases, knowledge of software is important, but generally speaking, it's very secondary. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, okay, well, you don't know Maya, but we use Maya. Well, you know, you'll just learn it in the first months while you're working here. It's like, we don't really care that you don't know it. Um, but we do care that we want to work with you and that you're nice. Yeah. You're a nice yeah. person. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I would say that, you know, like interview, like if you guys have interviews, think of that, like, like just be a nice, decent human being and you will sure. probably go a long way to, uh, yes. yourself and good getting tip. the job. Good tip. All right. Um, time wise, maybe you can fit a rapid fire question in here and then we'll take the break right after that guys. Um, is it important for, I don't know how rapid fire this question is, but let's, just, <laughs> let's try to answer it that way. Let's perhaps. Try. Uh, is it important for artists to know everything that there is to know about character art in 2021? That's, that's also a big question that we talked about yesterday. And I know you have a lot to say about it. I feel like as a character artist uh, working in games and not in, uh, in movies, like Magdalena said, we're already spread thin so much. There's so much we have to know. Um, from anatomy to cloth to sculpting to colors to lighting to materials to engine, um, that it's impossible. Uh, also, with the amazing level of quality that keeps growing uh, in the AAA and the advent of scanning and the expectations coming from this. Um, if you look at Drake uh, in the first game to Drake uh, now, what he looks up, Naughty Dog, is a, is a world or a whole world of difference. So I don't think so. And if I take it from uh, people who are probably listening, students, I think we all go through the same thing when we're in school. We're going to make a short movie and we're going to animate it and light it and, and, and do everything. And then we sadly realize that we can't do it all well so i think 
you should focus on um, on finding what interests you and then develop uh, proficiency in it and then show that you can do it. Uh, we live in a weird world where uh, there's a couple of um, skills that are going to be in high demands, like uh, marvelous or um, substance designer or Unreal Engine or Blender. So they're probably a good way into focusing uh, where you want to get your get like be interested to uh, to studios. I think those specialized skills are going to help a lot. Because yeah, a lot of I people, a lot of people in house have not learned those new skills, so you'll be fresh blood. Yeah, that's kind of what I think too. Uh, I think you've uh, put it uh, beautifully, and I don't necessarily have a lot to add to that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like what makes you valuable to a team is the skills that you bring that no one else on the team already has. Mm -hmm. uh, else, they wouldn't need you. They have that team on the team. They have that skill on the team uh, to begin with. So. Like for me, the best way really to really separate yourself from like everyone else is to like find that niche or niche, which isn't necessarily an easy thing to do, but there are a lot of these opportunities really of what is it that most people who do character art don't necessarily focus on, mm -hmm. but yet is an important skill to bring to a video game production. You know, like cloth, you know, like you've just mentioned a marvelous designer yeah. and everything you've said there, I think is very, very true. Like um, I'm in talk with a student right now to go and um, teach them internally. Uh, and I won't say where and which uh, context, but um, they have said to me that essentially marvelous designer is a big challenge for them. There's not a lot of people on their team that actually knows that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they want uh, training to help the team improve there. but um they've said like yeah like next people we hire they have to know this like they have to know marvelous designer really really well you know because we don't have enough people on the team that are very proficient as far as that's concerned yeah. you know it's like finding those things that not a lot of people focus on and yet is very important is a great way to develop skills that will be invaluable and will help mm -hmm. you guys find a job afterward but yeah like i don't think that it's important for like everyone to know everything as far as character art is concerned i think that spe like specialization is really the name of the game now i got that robot this uh just move move the screen please i can't look at it anymore okay okay <laughs> Thank you. here we go uh, <laughs> look at something more colorful okay. uh there you go uh, of colors <laughs> but yeah. yeah i'm kind of going through that past too i'm like whatever i do it needs to be lots of colors for some reason yeah, mm. yeah i saw it with your last piece with so just gl glitter bomb oh yeah it's just fucking <laughs> uh pitch all of that on there um Good. cool all right guys uh i think this was a very very interesting first half to the interview guys let's take a break let's take a 15 minute break after the break, we will uh, move on to more practical uh, matters. Uh, Guillaume will give us a few tips and tricks. And uh, we have, maybe we have a few surprises there. I'm not quite sure, but that's the nature of a surprise, right? So yeah. we'll see what's gonna happen. Um, oh. And then of course, we will have our Q&A. So you guys will have a chance to ask questions. 